Welcome. I'm Barbara Call, Senior Director of Content Strategy and Operations at IDG, and I'll be your host and moderator for today's webcast, titled Enabling Enterprise Connectivity, Codeless Platforms, and the Accelerated Pace of Modernization, and brought to you by IDG, IDC, and Team Dynamics. I have two speakers joining me today. First up is Andrew Graff, Chief Product Officer for Team Dynamics. Andrew's passion lies in helping organizations thrive in an ever-changing environment. As a co-founder of Team Dynamics, Andrew is well-versed in the common issues facing IT leaders. As organizations strive to reduce the drain on IT budgets and resources, while also pushing more spend towards strategic initiatives, he's able to help map out a way forward. Welcome, Andrew. Hi, great to be here. Thanks, Barbara. Maureen Fleming, Vice President of Intelligent Process Automation Research at IDC, is also with us today. Maureen focuses on software that helps organizations build and integrate applications and improve processes. Welcome, Maureen. Welcome. And now I'll hand things over to Maureen to run through her portion of the presentation. Maureen, over to you. Thanks, Barbara. Hello, everyone. During my portion of today's session, we'll go through three related ideas. The first is a look at top business priorities and how those relate to technology adoption. The second idea is the growing problem with IT skill shortages and why that relates both to how development platforms are changing, how IT is changing, and how some business users will be upskilled to take on some parts of development. And finally, we'll look in more detail at codeless platforms and how they're supporting the need to accelerate digital enablement. Whether you work for a company that has fewer than a 1,000 employees or more, it's likely that the top five priorities will be the same. From our February survey looking at enterprise resilience, you can see from this chart that everyone is focused on the basics of business. Businesses want to improve their ability to innovate, grow profit, improve customer satisfaction, improve operational efficiency, and grow revenue. If you're in an organization with fewer than a 1,000 employees, you can see here that the top priority is on innovation. You may already be seeing changes in your workplace because of that. But if you're in an enterprise with more than a 1,000 employees, the top priority is to become more profitable, and that probably is also impacting you. The second highest priority is revenue growth for large enterprises. It's likely that initiatives are already underway to enable these changes as thinking shifts to post-pandemic recovery planning. We also asked survey respondents a series of questions to consider which of the workplace changes that occurred because of the pandemic will continue post-pandemic. The top four enduring changes were the same for both the over 1,000 employee group and the under 1,000 employee group. The first is that work, the workplace will support hybrid work models with both remote and in-the-office configurations. Digital workspaces will continue to be an important place to collaborate and work virtually. And also, the pace of cloud adoption accelerated over the past year, and that will continue. We're not really seeing any trend that puts software back in the data center. And finally, we'll also see a continuation of efforts to automate at work. That includes increasing the number of repetitive tasks that are automated, as well as the adoption of workflow automation. When you divide these four into two groups, the first group is about where you work and how you as an individual and participant and a team use technology to support innovation by enabling all workers to better collaborate, create, and execute high-value work. The second group lowers costs. Those technologies offer a path toward what that important business driver of growth and profitability that we discussed in the previous slide. These technologies, beyond lowering costs, also support connecting our remote work to our applications and systems in order to work more efficiently, and they support greater automation. This group of technologies gives time back to workers to focus on more important aspects of their job. Now let's get into what I think of as the disruptive piece of the session. We'll be looking at how IT skill shortages will impact what we do in our jobs in the future. 
At IDC, we looked at the rate of growth in new applications and overall technology enablement requirements. The rate of growth is far outpacing the growth in the number of developers available to do the work. The rate of growth is far outpacing the ability for enterprises to afford the number of developers needed to meet their demand for technology enablement. That means something has to change, but really, three things have to change, and that's what we'll cover over the rest of my presentation and also be discussing that with Andrew. Change number one is the insertion of business users into the development workforce. Today, only 4% of workers in an organization have any type of development duty. Over the past year especially, we're seeing unprecedented efforts by enterprises to upskill business users into part-time developers. So why have they been doing that? I think there's a much broader recognition that to continue on the pace of digital enablement and application delivery that's required, that means we have to move business workers into developer roles. In other words, we have to upskill their jobs. In fact, our developer analyst at IDC published a prediction in October stating that by 2024, 45% of workers and organizations will have been upskilled to support some type of development or automation duty. These workers will be the fastest growing type of employee by 2024. Barring any change to the speed and approach to application development, this means that nearly half of all employees will be involved in some form of technology-based development. And that's pretty shocking to think about. It also explains why enterprises are building business user developer programs, which I think is really more commonly referred to as citizen developers. For those of us who don't want to become uh, developers, we have to depend on other techniques to reduce that dependency on manual development. In fact, development must increasingly be automated, and it needs to be radically simplified. And we'll get into that later. But meanwhile, Andrew, what are you seeing? Do you see things related to this? Absolutely. I really love this slide because it's exactly what we're seeing. I think, I think that what the market is seeing is that there is a lot of opportunity to make faster progress towards the objectives that you laid out for both the 500 to 1,000 and 1,000 and above those organizations. How can we get there faster? And one of the biggest constraints is this automation integration transformation issue where we just can't move quickly enough. And people in the business were giving us feedback, listen, we are so far back in the backlog to take advantage of the opportunity to grow revenue, to innovate, et cetera, to bring on new systems, to make them effective towards reaching our goals, that sometimes it's, it's stifling for us. So we need to expand, we need to expand the opportunity for us in the Alliance business to be able to see our visions to fruition. And this is like, I think I, I love this because it's critical to, I think what we're seeing and doing in the marketplace. Yeah, I, I absolutely see this. Yeah, I'm glad you do because it shocked me. I will tell you that when I saw, when we started looking at the model and seeing the implications of it, it was pretty interesting. Okay, so let's talk a little bit more about how this happened. Up until now, all development has been focused on top-down improvements on behalf of business process domains. For example, we focus on improving customer experience by creating better customer care centers or improving our digital commerce efforts or our supply chain. We focus on improving profitability by fixing problems with exceptions in our financial processes. The traditional sense of digital enablement fosters a process-first mindset, and virtually all development efforts are aimed at supporting this process-first approach. This will continue, but change number two is the need for professional developers to improve their productivity so they can do more. We really have to focus on the use of the new types of codeless development tools and automation to make developers dramatically more productive if we want to make efforts to reduce the number of business users conscripted into playing a larger role. But when business users come into the mix as developers, this mindset has to flip to a bottom-up approach, focusing on helping individual coworkers to work better, smarter, faster, and more automated. In this people-first mindset, business users are automating and they're building single-function applications called task apps. 
that improve the efficiency of doing the work. They use APIs to plug the automation or the task app into our larger process-centric applications to improve overall performance. When this is used to competitively differentiate, we see improvements in innovation, we're likely to see revenue growth, and we will definitely see improvements in profitability. So again, to Andrew, are you, ta are, are you talking to customers about this people first, process first, or something similar when you discuss this with your clients? We, we are. So this is, this is exactly uh, parallel to what we're seeing. And we're, we're seeing pressure on both of these sides. So we're seeing at the, from the process first perspective, just overwhelmed teams that need to find a way to dig out of all of the opportunity that's been presented to them to be more efficient and effective. And then on the other side, as I mentioned earlier, we're, we're seeing a tremendous demand for the business user, users who say, I can envision what I need. I, I, I know functionally how this should work. If I could only get the developer's time to make it happen, it would improve my business. And so we're, we're seeing it from both. I think we, we see some concern from the top of this when it comes to, well, if we start letting the line of business build in automations and, and integrations, is that going to create a tremendous amount of security risk? Um, is it going to increase our support load? Are we going to be running around fixing all of this? So I think what we're also seeing is that the the powers that be sometimes from an infrastructure perspective want to see some guardrails. They want to know that they can protect the data when it's when it's necessary so that you can't get too much trouble. That's usually the concern. That's the conflict area we're seeing between these two. And I, that's, app, that's infinitely resolvable. But it's once you get over that, there's absolutely demand on both sides of this. I also love this slide as well because I think it represents exactly what we're seeing. Yeah, you know, I saw that same resistance, um, you know, several years ago when the idea of codeless becoming a possibility. And uh, so people were really re resistant because of what you were talking about. But mm -hmm. now it's just sort of inevitable. And, and also the tools are becoming a lot more sophisticated. So it's actually doable Absolutely. to do that layering of security and absolutely yeah, and, and is it yep okay all right so now let's talk one more one more one more about this which is why you know for business users they didn't go to college to become computer scientists to become developers so why should they want to do this and by the same token developers who went to college to be and took computer science to be able to build things using programming languages and their skills they didn't sign up for codeless so what's the incentive Right. I think that's important. And one thing that that we're noticing is that there is you know, we, there's there have been discussions about T-shaped workers for a long time. But now they're really prized, especially um, the T-shaped workers who have that technology competency from the business side and the um, business competency from the developer side. And the point I want to make about this is that some of the research that I've done in other you know, in other areas are showing that T-shaped workers get paid better. And developers who've got business skills and are very focused at, at, at commanding, commanding how to build in, in a low code way, especially all those lower level capabilities, they tend to get paid higher than web stack developers, for example. And on the business side, if you've got someone who's technology competent and a subject matter expert in business, those people also command a higher salary. There's more demand for both both roles. And so how I think about this, um, when I think about technology enabling the work I perform, I go back to Tom Sawyer, who famously turned a task, a tedious, awful task, whitewashing a fence, into a privilege where every kid in town wanted to paint the fence. That got the job done in less than half the time. And that's how I think about me as a developer. If I can spend half my time improving how I work, then I have far less work to do. So in my case, technology enablement becomes a privilege. I mentioned earlier that there were three major changes required to reduce the need for developers. The first was upskilling business users. The second was substantially improving the productivity of developers. And the third change is the broad adoption of codeless development platforms. 
So let's set the stage for what that actually means. Codeless development means you can build, integrate, and automate applications, workflows, manual tasks, you know, different types of digital enablement without the need to use a programming language. The platforms consist of a development environment and an execution capability to run the software you built in production. And a really important part of these platforms is the library of pre-built capabilities that you drag and drop into the de development studio and configure. Also, with most of these platforms, IT teams are able to build and extend the library with assets that are relevant to the organization. So it's really common to think about connecting the custom applications via an API, and the development team will build the API and then add that to the library. And the same is true for database connectors so that it becomes easy for everyone to be able to access these assets to speed up what they're doing and also to re reduce confusion. It's also common to start thinking about building snippets of code that are reusable and also um, templates and things like that. All the things that are useful for um, you know, business users to just grab dra and drag into the environment. And the data scientist group may package together AI services that are callable from the codeless environment. All of these value-added components become part of the development library. And codeless development is not just constrained to business users. Both IT and business users use this. And increasingly, there are collaborative resources between the two groups where some of the easier and business-specific elements are constructed by a business subject matter expert. And developers work on the lower level, non-business-specific capabilities tied to touching low-level systems, and as well as supporting security. There are six core types of codeless development platforms, and there are common configurations where different elements are packaged together. So these are not pure definitions, but sort of ish definitions. In the upper left box, API integration consists of libraries of pre-built APIs and connectors that provide easy ways to securely access applications and to connect to databases. Developers can build and add APIs, like I said earlier, and they can build custom snippets and templates that speed up development. Teams have access to these library elements to support integration, and they can also use them typically to build out higher level automated workflows. Codeless workflow platforms are used by business and IT developers to automate how work is passed from one user to the next or for straight through automation. Workflow platforms typically include a form's development capability, a way to link data to the form, and a way to assign work to a group of users. Application platforms also include forms, and they also have a database. The studio contains pre-built form templates, configurable rules or policies, as well as actions that can be taken to execute the business logic. These are used internally by enterprises and also often have a customer or partner facing capability to enable users to fill out forms, which collect the information and store it into a database. Workflow is often supported in codeless application platforms. Data prep pulls from multiple databases and aggregates and converts it into a, a form that can be received by a data store. Codeless data prep helps business analyst teams prep data for reporting and analysis. Down in the middle is robotic process automation, which lives to automate human tasks. The environment consists of actions that mimic an end user interacting with an application. In production, a software robot plays the automation script to execute the work on behalf of the user. And low-code auto ML environments take lower-level AI models and configure them for specific use cases. It's common for a business user to label and categorize content to gain an understanding of the content through these platforms. Things like sentiment analysis and use of computer vision-based document understanding are used to extract machine-readable data out of content like an invoice or business form. And the other thing about them is that these are often packaged together. So it's common to see API integration with workflow, especially to support things like straight through automation. It's also common to see workflow uh, platforms integrated um, or come together with application platforms. 
And finally, it's also common to see robotic process automation combined with low-code AutoML. So what you'll see over the next several years are more and more of these applications or these platforms will come together. And then at the same time, what we're seeing a lot of is enterprises making decisions to build out a portfolio of each of these types in order to provide comprehensive codeless capabilities to their business users and to their uh, developer teams. One, one part of this that's really important is that, you know, you don't just wake up one morning and say, hey, I think I want to be a codeless developer and then start doing it. I mean, even though there's no programming, you have to, do, you have to sort of know how to use the environment. So gaining competency and use of a vendor's platform requires training to gain that competency. And there are different types of training, uh, depending on the vendor and the methodology the group uses, including online, online training and classroom led. You know, once you go through the training, that doesn't mean you really necessarily know how to use it to actually build a specific use case. Um, sometimes you can, but sometimes teams get business users maybe together with developers to sort of gamify this, to work on hackathons together as a way to go from training to create some muscle memory so that then people become much more comfortable using the platform. And they also, the, the other big issue that people have to sort of think through is that they just can't throw everyone on codeless development. Everyone has their primary jobs to do. If you're working full time at capacity, then suddenly how do you have time to actually build your own, you know, build your, do your own development or even develop on behalf of a team? So it's common to target one or a few people from a team and put them through training and hackathons and skills and enablement. They come back into the group with these skills with a reframed job where they often help others on the team with enablement. So they mentor other people. At the end of the day, the goal of these programs is to create enough work capacity through technology enablement to ensure that a certain number of workers are upskilled and able to build digital assets from themselves and their teams, while the team as a whole is able to complete their jobs, which have been modified by automation. Andrew, do you agree with me or what am I missing in the skills build out? You know, I do. I, I, I absolutely agree with you. I think I, I will add to it. And something that we've seen is that the momentum around an integration automation initiative largely has to do with how much value is added up front, right? If we see a lot of value added, then it tends to pick up a lot more information. The people who are not necessarily coders get thirsty for more success. So what we have seen to be very helpful is in that initial in that initial launch, rather than just focusing on training people on how to use the platform, do it within the context of something real. So we often coach customers to bring us their bring us their their most painful processes that are visible and everyone knows their manual that they could be automated. It takes lots of time, they're error prone or we've been waiting around forever to get this implemented add value and focus on it and use the training opportunity along with your professional services or people who know the platform to actually deliver it so that that at go live that team looks looks like heroes that tends from our experience to generate the most momentum because then people are thirsty to figure out okay how can i get my hands on this they did a great job of fixing that i see what the value that can be added that's been a great approach from the customers that we've uh, worked with that, that have taken it. Hmm. So I'll have to add that to my um, advice to clients then. So I'm done with my, my, my part of the presentation. And what I want to do is turn this over to you. So I'm going to forward this sure. and then it's all up to you to close it out. Okay, great. Awesome. Thank you so much, Maureen. I, I would reiterate everything you said, and I'm glad you said it because I think you're more eloquent. Um, than I am for certain, <laughs> certainly more knowledgeable in the space. So thank you very much. So again, my name is Andrew Graff. I'm Chief Product Officer at Team Dynamics. And I want to share with you some of the things we've seen in the industry. And we'll talk a little bit about our approach. And some of the, the trends we're seeing are obviously not specific to the Team Dynamics integration and automation platform. But the, the gist of it is this. When, when, we, when we heard the pains from our customers that they weren't able to take advantage of the opportunities to drive revenue, for example, or reduce costs, but also 
to plug holes where they needed more resource to focus on higher use purposes, but they're being drugged down by they're being drugged down by manual process, tedium, et cetera, error and bug fixing. We we looked at it and said, okay, there, there's got to be a great solution here. And so when we set out, we we knew that we had to allow people who didn't know how to write code to take advantage of these opportunities, like Maureen was saying. We knew that we had to turbocharge the teams that do know how to do it. So they understand technology, they know how to write code, but they just don't have the throughput that they'd like. They can't make the impact that they want fast enough. And they, they've got to get out from under the weight of their backlog. So we set out to build this, this integration platform on the latest scalable microservices technology to the latest NIST standards. So really something best of breed. And what, what became really evident is you, you needed to have a, a couple key things. And Maureen mentioned some of them, a library of connectors for common systems so that we could pick off the shelf the integration points and automation points with those systems that we use day in, day out. But then also the ability to quickly create new ones because a lot of organizations already have a library of APIs and endpoints that they've built. Maybe they already have webhooks stood up that should trigger certain things. Well, right now, those are locked away in a cabinet that only developers can get to. So how do we allow them to easily open that cabinet and make it easy for people to pull that off the shelf. So that was another critical part. It has to be easy to build build connectors and wrapper APIs with, with connector-like interfaces. So the other part is it has to be visual. It can't be, we, we can't expect everyone to know how to write XML and to be familiar with coding practices. So these were sort of the tenets. And we went out and did a lot of research into what systems need to do, what the business problems were. And it, it really started with framing the key processes. So I'll walk through some of these that, that we're really focused on. First is API risk. So typically when we went to customers and chief information security officers were always part of these conversations, we said, okay, where are all of your APIs in use across your ecosystem? And the answer was, there was just crickets. It's hard to say because we've been doing this for so long that these APIs have been used and it kind of grew like a Chia pet. You know, you don't really notice it, but then all of a sudden they're everywhere. And are they being authenticated against correctly? Do, do we have an easy library to access, as I mentioned earlier, so that we can take advantage of all these? And the answer is no. So we had to fix that problem. The other problem, which, which Maureen talked about a lot, was what about those skill sets? You know, typically an organization had a very small percentage of people who actually knew how to do this and they were underwater. We also saw a huge need to harmonize data. So one of the problems was, hey, we have data in lots of places. We need to bring that together. And most of the time, it's not in the right format. It's not delivered in the way we need it to take action. So we need to be able to fix that problem too. And then there was always security risks, scripts, the standardization around authentication methods, wanted to get our arms around these and then just time to delivery. The business, the business always had a huge backlog of things that we know would add value. And that small percentage of people couldn't get to it fast enough. And the lines of business were frustrated. The consulting dollars being spent to work around that team was excessive. So this was a huge opportunity to save money and also, also help drive our achievement of those objectives that Maureen laid out. So when we think about the actual codeless platform, what's, what's important was that we had that out-of-the-box connector library, so those major systems. You were able to manage APIs, make those easy to consume. And then we also realized that there are certain times where the people who could build the connector on the system we need are also the people who are buried under the load of a huge backlog of integration automation work. So we have a service called the Connector Concierge, which is essentially a team of people that build and enhance connectors and put them into out of, out of the box production production systems. So that's a real that's a real benefit we think as well. The other part of it is this visual builder, which Marine had talked about. So it doesn't require code, allows you to connect the systems you need, transform data. I like to use the word orchestrate or choreograph processes. You know, oftentimes especially with things like onboarding, it really is very much like a dance. And we have lots of systems that are working at the same time. Sometimes they need to be sequenced. I think the business users a lot of times can get their minds around what needs to happen. It's just hard to put it into practice. So we had to make that easy. And I think one of the, one of the 
one of the reefs that we leveraged were the research work of Google and MIT when it came to how do we take people who don't know how to write code and help them understand it and help them be able to build technology logic. And they have spent billions of dollars researching this. And there are two frameworks. One's called Blockly, one's called Scratch. And those are the frameworks that they developed with the help of educators, psychologists, researchers to help children learn technology and logic and how to implement it. So we've elected to use that interface, again, that, that Google and MIT driven interface, Blockly and Scratch, to inspire our framework. So essentially, this is an example of an onboarding flow. And that onboarding flow represents integration with multiple systems. So it's going through and it's taking data that's coming in from a service request, in this case, to hire somebody after it's been approved. It's determining if they need a Salesforce account, if they need a Zoom account and creating those. It's determining if they need a laptop, what kind of laptop, and sending procurement instructions for that. It's also going and instantiating their Active Directory capabilities. And it's actually integrating with the HRIS. So it's, it's choreographing all of these processes. So whereas we might have had 15 manual steps, now it's a single automated step. And if anything fails, it can loop back through. It can make sure that people are aware. It can post a message to Slack, send a, send a text. So it's very communicative in that, in that fashion. So we're really with ha happy with how it turned out. So let me give you a little more context about integration platform, automation platforms, and team dynamics. So what you're seeing here is a diagram of our product suite. On the top half of this diagram, you will see enterprise service management, not just for IT, but other departments providing service, all the tools for IT service management. You'll also see project portfolio management for helping implement new services, significantly change services, replace services. So all the tools that you need to manage the work in the organization. And in the middle at the top, you see self-service. So this is all about making it easier to work as a team, no matter what type of work we're doing, and also better for self-service. So how does an integration platform, an automation platform, complement your service management tool? Now, you could substitute another product on that top half, but foundationally, iPaaS is critical to how we work going forward. So if you think about service management, lots of service requests result in actions being taken. Many of those actions today are automated or manual, and they could be automated. So, for example, in HR, lots of changes get requested. Maybe I change jobs, and for that job change, I need different group membership and group permissions in Active Directory. Maybe I need a different set of access in our ERP system. So things need to change in lots of systems. What we saw is a lot of that is happening manually. Now, an iPaaS solution can choreograph that activity, that automation. So it's a logical extension of service management and a great place to add value. So we talked earlier about the enterprise value, the enterprise perspective of integration automation. Now, when it comes to service management, there is a very specific set of cases that this supports. So when we were approaching this, we recognized the enterprise opportunity and then we certainly, being in the service management and project portfolio management business and self-service business, saw the value in automation. When we went out to do our research and figure out, you know, should we build this platform? Should we, should we partner for it? What we came to recognize was that most companies had complex needs. They have lots of systems. No matter what your size, you have lots of complicated systems. You have needs that are similar to large enterprises. But what we also found was that the tools on the market we're out of reach, especially for a line of business. You know, a quarter of a million, half a million dollars a year was too much. So while we saw systems that provided enterprise capability, they were also priced for the top 1% of companies. So what we sat down and said, okay, can we build a world-class product that has enterprise capabilities, but make it financially accessible to 99% of organizations? And we believe we could. So that was sort of the genesis of our iPaaS platform. So there's a little bit of perspective on how Team Dynamics has approached iPaaS and how it, how it integrates seamlessly with a service management tool. Like, for example, if you had ServiceNow or you had another tool, integration is still a tremendous asset. What I will say, though, is that some of these automation tools and integration tools that come paired with a service management platform are very specific to just that service management platform. 
when you're looking, I might suggest looking at platforms that will work with any system. So it's not just service management platform to other enterprise system. It's enterprise system to enterprise system plus your service management tool. So I think that's one caveat there. But this has been great. Thank you. I, that, that wraps up our content. Excellent. Thank you both. That was really great. That's all the time we have for today. I'd like to say thank you to my speakers, Andrew Graff of Team Dynamics and Maureen Fleming with IDC. And thanks to you, our audience, for joining us. For additional information on this topic, please visit the resources section on your screen. For IDG, IDC, and Team Dynamics, I'm Barbara Call.